evening, everyone. I wanted to start off with a picture of a cow because it's this cow that seemed to be prolif uh, prolific in breeding in Picton in South Western Sydney. Yes, it's amazing. There was thousands of the heads of this Central African or South African cow that was called the Hottentot cow, which is known in Botswana and somehow brought over here. And I like the story because it doesn't make any sense and I don't believe the narrative whatsoever. And the narrative is that uh, Governor Philip came over, bought some cows from South, South Africa and came over to, brought them over to Sydney Cove, Circle Key. And there was like five, six or seven cows. One of them died. So it was like six cows, two bulls south, four cows. And they somehow made it out of the uh, ship that they were stored in. The uh, guard was drunk and they made it all the way over to Picton. Um, they bred and bred and bred. In 1801, there was five to 600 head. And then by 1804, there was thousands and thousands of them. Uh, just looking at this map, you can see what I find strange is that they would have crossed all this area of bushland at the time in this late 1700s and with Aboriginals who were apparently scared of them, amazingly, and they would have traveled 80 kilometers or more to get to Picton. And uh, it would have been quite an effort. And just looking at the um, rates of breeding, you've got, uh, what have you got? You have six cows and then 12, 13 years later, it's five to 600 head. This is an Australian bush, which is not their native habitat, and there would have been dingoes and that sort of thing. So I don't know how they, the cars would have made it. And they've somehow made it turned, in 1804, was 3,000 to 5,000 until MacArthur got involved. So that's quite an amazing breeding effort. They would Each calf would have grown up to breed. I mean, it would have been a, an, an amazing effort for a new species in the country to be so prolific but there you are that's apparently the claim and they went all the way across the entire part of sydney all the way to the other side and across the river i kind of find that a bit steep to believe uh but that is the story and that's why i think there's a big hole in the narrative even if you think that the british were the first europeans to settle even if you have the most conservative view of history i don't know how you justify that so that's just the start. Next thing I want to talk about is, uh, is, is Sydney, of course. I mean, and Sydney in general and Sydney Cove. This is an image of Sydney Cove around 1800, maybe a bit later. It's quite common for to have Aboriginals in the front just there as a token. And then you have all the civilization around it. It's all very nice. There's so much watercolours and almost all of them are done from a distance, i.e. the artist is always looking at it from a landscape point of view rather than looking as a village lifestyle thing. So it's always from a distance. So I find that interesting, though. The, the more personal watercolours and paintings do start happening around the late, uh, maybe 1810. You'll start getting village life type artwork. But... It, before that, it's always from a distance, and it's understandable, but at the same time, it's quite possible that we're not allowed in the village on the township, and that's why they did it from a distance. It's just an idea. Uh, this is Grimes' map of 1800, it's probably legitimate. Uh, it shows the original allotments, and a lot of historians, uh, uh, standard con conventional historians, have apparently made sense of all of the buildings and they think it was all correct from 1800 to 1804. One of the points of reference, if you ever want to figure out when the narrative is fairly reliable, is to work at when the first news newspaper started. The Sydney Gazette started around 1804. I think this is its offices from 1810, I believe. Uh, so they had premises in 1810 onwards, which is roughly around the time of the Rum Rebellion. They did start in 1803, 1804. So you can pretty much trust that what they're saying is roughly correct. And hence, the narrative from 1803 should be fairly accurate. It's just the point, is, it, is anything before 1803 accurate? And that's where it gets really difficult to determine. Um, you can only go for the records you've got. I've tried to look at all of these. Uh, uh, what have I got? Um, all of these journals, these diaries, but I, I'm just going to scroll through. These are diaries written by the people that was on the first fleet. All the officers wrote 
standard documentation, there is two people that are not officers where their narrative stops when they get around Botany Bay and heading into Port Jackson. Uh, so I don't know if this is reliable because obviously they can all be told to lie or they can tell, be told not to talk about any previous settlements on the sly. On the sly. They probably would have complied, been ha more, more too happy to leave out items, but uh, a couple of the, these people that wrote the diaries in the first fleet did stop journaling as they turned into Port Jackson. It ends around Botany Bay. So I have to go for each one, but you could do it yourself. So, you know, so now I'm wondering, well, what other records are there? There's obviously Governor Phillips' records, and there is John Hunter's. There's, there's John Hunter did a record of his transactions from 18, 1787 to 1792, and, and it's a 400-odd page document. It's quite a dry read, but I went through most, pretty much all of it, and I'm going to pick out some nice little tidbits to show you that the British were not the first Europeans there by their by their own admission in a way, and I'll go for it in detail. Some interesting tidbits. All right, so this is written, this was finished being written or published in 1793, apparently, though I did read somewhere that some of the records did take a while to get republished, and there was were a few authors. It wasn't just John Hunter. There was apparently a couple of his understudies involved. I'm not too sure. I tried to look online to see any evidence that it was published for sure in 1793, but may but I did feel that I read somewhere that wasn't published for another couple of decades. Um, well, at least some records have been delayed in their pub in being published. So someone needs to take some time to research that in full. Okay, so he, there's a huge amount of information about him get, leaving from England to, sorry, from, yeah, from England all the way to Cape. Um, Hope around South Africa and he goes through every detail. Once he gets to Port Jackson, he does a pretty good description of the natives. He does talk about their hair, the fact that they live very simply on wherever they sleep. They don't build anything. They're, they're quite in touch with nature. He, he writes that quite accurately. He's very good with that. Uh, further along, he just he mentions how the dingo is first mentioned in his narrative. It's quite interesting. Dingoes aren't that common in that part of Eastern Australia, but there you are. He mentions it straight away. Uh, he interestingly, uh, further along, because I went through all of this and tried to find all these interesting little clues, he mentions that a place that looks like it was designed to be a deer park. So you can imagine like an um, pl open plain with speckled trees here and there. Um, and it was located between Botany Bay and Sydney Cove. Now, I, I, I highlighted that because it could have, it, it, it might be coincidence, but I sometimes look at Sydney Cove based on the megalithic evidence that perhaps there were people hundreds of years ago trying to set up some kind of Gaelic-derived utopian culture and it, it just stopped and it got overgrown and there's some remnants and you can't really tell. I, I'm not sure, but I just fancied that. Um, uh, Hunter goes on about Van Diemen's Land. Now, Van Diemen's Land is Tasmania. He crosses Tasmania and doesn't mention any colonies there. But I'm pretty confident there was colonies there in Hobart Town by that time and also moving into the Melbourne area. But he doesn't mention that. And, me, and that I just thought I'd highlight that he does not mention any other ships and ship activity in southeastern Australia, though he does sail through it. So just thought I'd mention that. Uh, but now it gets the May, not 1789, it's his second trip or something like that, I don't know. He observes a native man of this country who was decently clothed and seemed to be much at ease at the tea table as any person he could manage his cup and saucer well. This is one year after the first fleet arrived um, and he was accustomed to having tea. Uh, that's really strange, and it's completely different to the rest of his narrative about Indigenous peoples. All of his narrative is, this is unique. And he's pointing out that he's trying to make a point that there is something different here, and that this man had an iron shackle to prevent him from going, and he, this man will refer to these shackles and other trinkets as Bang Ali, Bangali, if you can read that, which is just Bengali. Now, Bengali is, of course, 
the maritime power of the of, um, of Calcutta, I think it's yeah Calcutta. Uh, okay, so Bengali is the main maritime power, and of course they would have done trading all over the place, including going for whale oil and that kind of thing. So they would have been they would have been the prominent trading ship. So they get, that's another clue that the Aboriginals of Sydney Cove were occasionally trading in ornaments. Okay, so that's important. Uh, by 1789, in May, he says that this small pox suddenly turns up and he's all sad to see all the people dead. He's, he's all, it's quite sad about it, but I still don't know how smallpox would ever get there if people are on the ship with no smallpox, because you couldn't obviously stay on the ship with smallpox. And obviously, so I don't know what how that disease would be carried. Maybe it's carried latently, I, I don't know. So just, very interesting that it just turns up and everyone seems to get it. Um, he, Rose Hill near Parramatta is the most mentioned site of settlement in this entire narrative. Not Sydney Cove, though that is mentioned, Several and but Rose Hill is the settlement. Now, what I was always told when I was young is that it was always Sydney Cove, cut like the rocks. Second was Parramatta and close third was Toon Gabby. But in this narrative, I keep seeing Rose Hill as the most prominent settlement. Sydney Cove is the second one. And eventually others are mentioned. But I'll get to that a bit later. Indian corn is referenced a lot. I don't know if the British were into Indian corn. It's mentioned a lot. Okay, so um, another thing that's mentioned is his interest in going and taking a party up to Broken Bay, which is basically the entrance of the Hawkesbury River. All right, so the entrance of the Hawkesbury River is about here, and they wanted to take troops all the way up the roads here to get to here. Now, why would they do that? Is, is it what is so important? Why don't they just go more inland and around to where there's easy pickings for pasture land or something? Well, bro, this is this is the area that when you enter and you go along the Hawkesbury River, you can eventually make your way around the Nepean River and you'll get to Picton where those cows were. If you wanted to set up a hidden colony away from the British and everyone else and you're sick and tired of all the European rat bags, the French and everyone, you could probably set up a nice little colony right out in the Southern Highlands, which is probably a good place for it. There's a lot of strange stones and things out there that I've noticed and it would be quite likely that you wanted to have a secret colony, you could probably put it out there. Just an idea, and Broken Bay would probably be the best entrance point. Eve, and it'd be a long, long winding river, and it'll take you forever to find this colony. So that's probably a potential choice, of, militarily speaking, why you'd want to secure a big open port, a uh, bit of big open uh, port area, um, harbour like that. So that's probably possibility okay so uh but they keep going about smallpox so yes they they see a, a teenage late teenage young woman she's got smallpox um and they they go on about how they're caring and they're, they're wretched souls and they're trying to look after them and this is the sort of story you get the word for water is badu Bardo or Bardi, Bardo. Um, just sort of mention that because it could be a cognate of Wadi. You get Wadi around Australian indigenous languages referring to water, and that is a close cognate of the Afghan or the Arabian word for Wadi, which is water or a creek or a river. So you'll get Afghan cognates a lot when you study this su subject. Uh, now, I keep finding throughout all of Hunter's recollections that people go missing all the time. Uh, so <laughs> they keep losing people and they, they keep saying, like, where are they? they get lost? They must be all be drunk or something. I, I don't know. Um, the names of the ships, the Sirius is one ship. Um, so the Sirius is, the, is like the, the, the important star, the guiding star. So the British would have been part of a long heritage of potentially the occult, which I will, which I think we should consider. Justinian and the surprise with the Z. Okay, so Justinian, the naming of that is like from the Justinian Empire, Emperor, which was 
where we get the original Justinian maritime feudal law and that kind of stuff. You've got other ships called Guardian, which is fair enough. Gorgon, which is the original uh, snakehead uh, um, uh, priestesses of ancient times. I well, think interesting ship names, sort of mentioned that. Uh, around 1789, 91, something like that, they hire a Dutch ship, of all things, to take stuff to and from Batavia. Just sort of mentioned that, that they had to engage in, in a Dutch ship because they're running out of supplies and they're desperate. I don't know if the Dutch ship was already going to Sydney or not. I don't know. Um, they built a pyramid on the uh, on the south head out and in the entrance to Port Jackson so that people could use it as a reference point. The pyramid uh, is on some of the old original Sydney maps. Um, interesting is that right at the beginning, they uh, they the, 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 the British John Hunter um part of the first fleet and all that john hunter was yeah so they decide to have such fantastic relations with the french they go over to make sure they're okay can there be if any assistance to to monsieur de la perouse uh, <laughs> i mean there's the french and the english have been fighting one another for wars and later on in that in, in the end of the 19th century they'll be in fierce battle and they're just out there as gentlemen caring for each other so i find that interesting how they're always trying to get along with the french which is completely strange if you because there's just so much anglo uh, french wars going on anyway um now this is where it gets really 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 strange now i always thought that australia and like anywhere in the world that you can you can get uh, paranormal events occurring, and uh, I, I've 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 known people that have had paranormal experiences, or, I've known, or someone on the channel that works with me on the channel has had a paranormal experience, knows firsthand, and it is in in folklore a lot of paranormal activity has been well documented with in the Australian bush, and this is a strange one. Um, there's apparitions in the country which he calls mané. He describes them as coming up with a strange noise and catching hold of anyone by their throat. He made use of many words on this occasion and pointed up to the sky. He also informed us that these apparitions singed the beards and the hair. This, he describes, is a very painful operation, rubbing his face after every application of the brand. This is quite spooky in a way, is that you've got this paranormal thing now coming in and, it, and it's written down. You've got to understand that the British are seasoned invaders. They would have been the most civilised on the front end, but when you go into the back end and go maybe into deep history, maybe go back to the Scots, there's, there, or any, any of them really, they, they have been involved in black magic and black magic has been a part of invasion tactics for a long time. So that's probably another topic for another video. I'm not well versed on that, but it, it's very important to know that there's paranormal phenomena being described. This, this, this cannot be described anything else. This can't be lightning. It can't be anything else. This is unusual. And I usually believe things first of all, I'll be open-minded enough if there is uh, testimony. Um, really interesting, on, on around this um, same part of the document, we have language being introduced. Now, the females of the tribes around Sydney were referred to as Leon, which is uh, obviously uh, like lion in in, uh, in French, uh, around the French region, and gal, G-A-L, which is tribe. Now, gal, this is interesting, these two words, he's chosen this. This could be then a theory on the origin of the pre pre British European peoples being probably Gaelic or Western French or Western Spanish, because Leon would mean lion and would probably be related to a woman, and Gao is the clan. So that fits very well. Is that Gal, or like as in Portugal, uh, being the people of the port, uh, it would be suitable if you had. Uh, Gaelic patriarchs probably in the 15th, 16th century coming out there and settling around Sydney and possibly integrating with the locals. 
uh, it would make sense that they would introduce some of their main language and then adopt the indigenous language for everything else. You would have to go for some analysis, look for the cognates with Tamil and Malay, and you could probably get somewhere with that. Um, I just want to say again is that throughout all of his narrative, he hardly goes on about anything else but Rose Hill and maybe Sydney. He never talks hardly about Parramatta and Toon Gabby. Now, when I grew up, as I said again, the Parramatta was going on and on about that. Everyone went on about Parramatta being, oh, it's, an, it's, it's, it's close second, and Toon Gabby, which is not mentioned at all in his documents. It's a close third, but it's not mentioned. So just sort of that I mentioned that. This is really good here. This is this gets good here. Okay, so um, it's one of those days when a campfire, whatever, breakfast in this case, and these indigenous people come, and there was a bright copper colour woman. Her features were pleasing and of that kind of turn that had she been in any European settlement, no one would have doubted her being a mulatto. So that means a hybrid, uh, white and black. And so that's pretty interesting. Um, I wanted to, that pretty much is a giveaway. I mean, there's no way you could have the indigenous Aborigines as we know them as being mulattoes. There's no chance of that, which means there was obviously previous European contact. That's pretty much now admitted. The first mention of Pamula Way of the Bejigal, Gal again, tribe. He is, of course, the fiercest warrior of, I hope I pronounced that right, Pamula Way. He is the fiercest warrior that the British encountered. That's what you should know that. He, he is regarded by them as the hero, the main hero of the indigenous people. Lot, uh, I don't know how the British ever amounted to anything because they had like people dying all the time. There was so much death, so it was 156 in one year. Pretty bad. Uh, eventually, we get to hear Parramatta and Hawkesbury. It took them all this time for John Hunter to finally say Parramatta and Hawkesbury. Well, that's terrific, isn't it? Okay. Now, where what it gets to towards the end, and this is this, one of the smoking guns, that the Irish are particularly annoying to him, and the Irish are convinced of the Chinese settlements north. Chinese settlements, there you go. They they don't they don't really they, they think it's fancy, but there. But more importantly, it's the copper colored people only 150 miles to the northward where they would be free. Wow. The copper colored people. All right. That's what I call it. Here is the image of the copper colour. This is image. This is not. This is apparently the natives of Botany Bay. Uh, to me, I, I look. I, people say that um, that the artists of the day would anglicise or would bleach out or would make their watercolours. They would alter them in order to be more pleasing to. The people back home. Um, now, generally speaking, what I've noticed about these drawings by these uh, explorers is that they would take pride in being technically accurate. You look at all their drawings, whenever you know it's true, it's pretty much spot on where you'd think it would be. They, they usually do these drawings pretty accurate because they want to take pride in being accurate. They're technical drawings in, in many respects. Uh, so this is accurate. This is what they saw. That's the way it is. Um, they don't lie about these things, just so you know, because it's it's like map making. They don't they don't make it up because they they know that in the future they'll be held account to that, and they 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 um, they take uh, they value their reputation. So where do we go to from here? I mean, how do I, we contextualize it? They talk about uh, there is a section. In uh, in John Hunter's accounts, where they clear all the land and they build in a space of two years, they start building a settlement, and he references that in Sydney Cove. Um, so is that true? Did they do it in two years, and did, did the whole all this stuff get built in 10, 15 years? Well, maybe. 
So, but can we trust it? Now, the only way to get around this is we've got to start thinking a little bit more contextually because the way I see things is that you don't know who built each building. There could have been uh, freeholders coming on their own accord, built a few places and told Governor Philip, can I do it? And then Governor Philip said yes and then cheated them off their land later on. You just don't know. I don't, you just don't know. Because everything up to the the frontier wars and then the rum rebellion thereafter, anything could have happened. So it makes it very hard to gauge who and why people did things when there's so much of a wild west here that you don't know who did what and when. I mean, there's little things like I mean, just things. Like I, I look at this map here, and this is the map of Newcastle Harbour, which was called Port Hunter originally. And apparently it was, it's just, and this is roughly, roughly just a bit over 150 miles northward of Sydney, where it was mentioned that the copper coloured people were, where they would be free. And this map is from 1819 or something. And apparently it's all open land, it's all free, it's totally it's totally unsettled or near enough. But you see these images just there of buildings that just are just there. Apparently they're the buildings to be built on site. So the history of this map is just a bit odd. Why would you have a map of free area and then put actual structures there where the structures are already existing? Were the structures made by independent people coming out around the 1800s and maybe thought that they could use the land for whatever reason. Maybe they had a verbal agreement. Maybe there was pre-existing European people or maybe the indigenous said, yeah, you can build a land here and we don't care about the British. And, and then the British came in 1819 and took it over and said that they built it. I mean, that's probably how a lot of these places are repurposed um i don't think the british did much other than broker deals and stuff i don't think they actually did anything substantial i think the ambitions of free people did and then sometimes if they didn't get in the way of if they didn't side up to the british in the right time they could have had their history wiped out it's hard to know um this is a map i've went through in another video this uh shows I won't go into detail, but it shows things like Cabramatta. I think this is the map. Anyway, there's, there's like Cabramatta, which I've worked out was Gaelic or Galatian pigeon for like goat farm, goat abattoir. And, you know, there's old Windsor Road somewhere and it doesn't make any sense why there's an old Windsor Road and the map's pretty much as old as the first fleet just about. So how do you have all, anything called old anything where everything, nothing was there in the first place? So they're just, there's just these little odd things. Um, another thing is that just walking around the rocks, Suez Canal is this, what, it's a funny name to call something in the first place, Suez Canal. But you know, they were, the, the history. This is the official history. The first recorded name, the wider portion of the Suez Canal was the Suez Canal was Riley's Lane. The first recorded name of the wider portion of the Suez Canal was Riley's Lane, thought to be a misspelling of the surname of William Riley. Uh, so you know, like Riley is an Irish name. I'm pretty certain the Irish would have been there in in step at the same time or even before the British. And they might have bought, I mean, it's very hard to know how things happen. There's all these little anomalies that, though. You go around and you say, well, what's, like, I'm trying to find actual forensic evidence of something. I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to be fanciful or say, like, terrier. Or, I'm actually trying to look for the actual smoking gun and the ants. I'm having an enormous amount of difficulty trying to prove something because, you know, it's, it's even pigeon English in Port Jackson. Like, how do you have pigeon English when you're completely arguing with each other, having fights with these locals? I mean, I know you would have to have a pigeon English, but normally it's born out of, of long-term uh, communication between different cultures over several years to create a pigeon language. But 
interesting to note there was a Port Jackson pigeon as well. So in conclusion, what I, what I feel is that uh, the next things that you can do to prove one thing or the other is that you'd have to look at the Governor Phillips' actual records uh, and look at them forensically to see if he's saying something that, you know, he's saying something or not. Like, um, the other thing is that you probably need to go to Windsor and Richmond. I find that those places are probably older than we're told. And you'd have to go to the historical societies and try to find out what their earliest floor plans of buildings. There's tunnels out there, apparently. So there's a few anomalies that no one knew about, which indicates that that place has a bit of a hidden history to it. Uh, you you probably have to look into what an independent community is. So you might get a bunch of Irish people going out to a modern day Singleton in north, uh, north of Sydney, uh, which was originally called Patrick and then that name gets changed. So you, sometimes you've got to understand that independent communities could have happened concurrently to the British coming. And then, so maybe not a not long time prior to the British, but they set up shop, they do all the hard work, they get to know the natives, they form peaceful relations and the British come and screw all that up. That's probably how you need to look at things. My conclusions are, uh, to date, is that the, that there is megalithic there is megalithic evidence around Sydney and people like Rex Gilroy have done a huge amount of work proving that there's been semi-civilized cultures going back a, hundreds of thousands of years across Australia including Sydney I, I think that there was definitely uh, moderate uh, Asian and European influences probably not a huge township in around Sydney um, I cannot justify how you could have 5,000 head of cattle in Picton. I suspect that uh, Governor Phillip did not record all his actions. I know that uh, the early governors prevented people from passing the Nepean River and it was a no-go zone. So I suspect that they their soldiers were secretly out there dealing with the problem of free settlers and, and the indigenous and they probably would have taken any cattle and moved them northward towards Picton. I suspect that these are Southern Highlands cattle that was probably mustered up north towards Picton after they successfully took over some of the uh, pre-British settlements that may not have been heavily civilised, but they might have been, you know, people who have come prior to the British. I suspect that that is the most likely scenario. And they probably accessed that, those areas via Isla Jarvis Bay, uh, Lake Illawarra, uh, Broken Bay up north, that probably would have been the access points. Probably not heavily populated, but either way, no one was allowed to go out there and they probably were doing the deeds to, to get rid of any evidence of previous occupation. And then the cattle was just brought forward. That's the most logical. Um, I can see the Indian Bengali influences. Uh, I can see um, there's obviously copper-coloured people that, and there's Chinese communities. So now, so what, so what does that leave us? Was there a huge uh, fake narrative? Was there a massive township with lots and lots of buildings for previous culture in Sydney? No, I don't think so. I do think that when, we, when I investigate Adelaide, Melbourne and some regional Victoria and Tasmania, yes, I find that there was a stark problem with the narrative. That is probably where you're going to find your big, big gaps. But I decided to do Sydney just to make sure that I had covered off on it so that so that I wanted to actually put a huge amount of time into it to, to say, well, okay, Sydney is probably a bit more complicated because it's not a massive sprawling township prior to the British. It was probably... As several sprinklings of cultures coming in and sort of assimilating throughout the existing uh, native peoples. That's it. Thank you.